to start, I'd like everybody here to think about somebody that's important in their life right now. It can be a relative, maybe a parent, a sibling, your children, or a close friend. Now picture a Wednesday morning, you walk into the kitchen, and there they are on the floor, unresponsive. What do you do? You call 911. The phone rings, rings again, rings a third time, but there's no response. You think to yourself, okay, maybe I, I didn't put the number in right. 911. The phone rings, rings again, but still no answer. On April 9th, 2014, this happened over 6,000 times. On this day, the 911 routing system went down in seven states across America. What had happened is, over time, we've been moving our 911 routing systems away from telecommunication equipment to IP-based routing. A third-party provider by the name of Intrado um, is one of these providers that runs this IP system. And on this day, their routing system broke. So when a 911 call goes out, it hits a routing provider, and they'll assign a unique ID, and then decide which call center to forward that number to. That unique ID is used to identify the call in the case across multiple departments, from the call center to the fire department, EMS, or the police department. But there was a bug in Intrado's code. They had hard-coded the number of IDs they'd be able to generate, and on April 9th, they hit that limit. It took over eight hours to rectify the issue. The software we build, the systems we build, the stuff we put out there has real impact. And we all commonly say that software is eating the world. And as it's doing that, our responsibility to the people around us grows. We're moving from a time when our system's not working meant somebody couldn't consume media on the internet to today where if our systems don't work, people can't pay their bills, transportation grinds to a halt, and they can't reach out for help to 911. I come from Ontario, the province of Ontario up in Canada, and in Ontario, <laughs> woo, clapping for Ontario, any claps for Ontario? Um, in Ontario, uh, over 50% of our energy is generated through nuclear power. And if you're lucky, you can actually go and get a tour through one of these factories. So imagine you're walking through and you're seeing all the engineers in their hard hats, you've seen the control room with the dials and the gauges and the buttons controlling everything, and you're walking on your way out and you see something out of the corner of your eye. Move fast and break things. <laughs> Gives you pause for a moment, doesn't it? I mean, this nuclear power plant's only 100 kilometers away from where I live. I'm not sure I want the nuclear engineers there to be moving fast and breaking things. Yet, if we were to walk into any tech office in the valley, here, and you saw this sign, you wouldn't think twice. Of course it's there. If we think about in nuclear energy, though, we think of this highly reliable, secure, they've got, all, they've got uh, everything sort of figured out, how to build secure systems. But it turns out this isn't the case. Back in 79, this is a picture of the Three Mile Island power, power plant. In 1979, um, after a series of mechanical failures and operator mistakes, one of the reactors had a meltdown. And during this meltdown, and as the ensuing emergency sort of evolved, it turned out that there was no plan. They had built this nuclear power plant, assuming they built a bunch of safety into it, but they assumed it would always work. There would never be an issue. So when there was an issue, and people had to say, okay, what do we do now? Nobody had an answer. And only after this event, in 1979, did we say all nuclear power plants going forward had to have an emergency plan. If something blows up, if something goes wrong, we know what we're going to do and how we move forward. In the airline industry, they have a, a phrase for this. It's called tombstone mentality. Every now and again, there will be something, maybe a mechanical failure, maybe a cultural problem, that everybody will know, will be aware of, but nobody will do anything to fix it until there's an accident and somebody pays their life. And that's because people are reactive. 
all of us, we wait for something to happen before we figure out, all right, what are we going to do um, when something goes wrong? The problem is, is that in the past, all these different industries, all these different accidents, their repercussions were localized. For us, software, its biggest selling point is its leverage. Um, we can have one engineer uh, build a service for 100,000 uh, people out there. If our software breaks, it's not going to affect maybe a part of a country. It can affect an entire continent or potentially even the globe. So what's going on is we don't have that luxury. We don't have the luxury that other industries had to wait for something to go wrong and then learn from those lessons. Instead, we have to be proactive somehow. We have to look out, see where we can grab these lessons, and then learn from them. Luckily, there's a lot of industries we can do that with. There's the aerospace industry, energy, medicine, natural disasters. To give you an idea of how long these other industries have been doing it, the National Transportation Safety Board has investigated over 140,000 aviation incidents. Today, you would have to travel every single day on an airplane for 3,000 years before you experience an accident. There's a lot we can learn from these other industries. So my name is Emil. I'm a production engineer at Shopify. And I think a lot about the impact our software has on the people around us when it works and when it doesn't work. And about a year ago, I realized that, um, wait, if all these other industries have already went through a lot of these problems, what can we go and learn in these other industries and take back and apply in software? And so that's what I did. I went out, I started reading a bunch of really dry manuals, uh, read, listened to podcasts, read books. And so today, I'm going to be showing some of the th things I learned that I think would be very powerful and useful for you all to uh, take from, go back, and try to implement. So when you go and dive into emergency management, which would be sort of the academic term for it, um, all emergencies, crises, or disasters can be broken down into sort of four cycles or four steps. You've got mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. So with mitigation, this is trying to identify the risks and where the issues can come from and reducing their chance of occurring. Preparedness is um, how do we respond to the issue when it happens. Response will be the actual response, and recovery is getting back to normal. So a way I like to think about this is, um, say you have a database service, and your application calls out to the database service. And this database um, has a primary and a standby. Mitigation would be modifying your application so that if it loses connectivity to the database, it can still serve some requests. Preparedness is having an on-call. If the database goes down, who's going to go and respond? That's preparedness. Response is actually the tools you'll be running so that you can switch over from the primary database to the standby. And then recovery is setting up a new standby for the currently running database. So mitigation. With mitigation, it's actually um, interesting because in the outside of technology, mitigation is almost viewed as um, isn't, isn't really focused on. There is a phrase that's often that's used, um, nobody ever got fired for failing to mitigate a disaster. Disasters will always happen. So why invest in, um, in uh, lowering their impact? But we know in tech that's not true. Surely by the number and size of our services, we know that good investment in resiliency can have a big impact. But there's still weak, stuff we can learn from other industries. So, as I was reading through these materials, uh, I was getting on to uh, reading about how engineers design airplanes and rockets. Every single part in an airplane is meticulously tracked how long it's flown, how many times it's been flown, when was the last time maintenance was done on that part, and then if you hit a certain number of pressurizations, the part will either be replaced or it'll be um, rated to do another certain number of pressurizations. Imagine if every time we wrote a function, we said, this function is ready to be called a million times. And at the millionth time, the moment's called, there's somebody gets an issue, and now we have to go and we have to reevaluate. Maybe the function works great. Maybe we don't need to rewrite it. Or maybe we realize that we didn't build it properly the first time, and we go and we do a refactor. This sort of approach could be very interesting. 
Another thing is actually putting risk numbers and chances of failure to our systems. There's a lot of tools that uh, the aerospace industry uses to assign um, the chance or likelihood of something breaking. And one of these is a fault tree. So in a fault tree, you're doing deductive reasoning on a single component in your service failing, and then you'll build out Boolean operators going down. So if uh, a database service that has quorum, in order for it to, to lose quorum, it needs to lose up to three nodes if there's five. So you would have an and operator that would say three nodes go down. Now on a node, you'll say, okay, the node stops working if it loses its network connection, if the disk fails, or if the C CPU blows up. So you can have an or on either of those three. And then you can go and look at the data and you can say, okay, well, the chances of the CPU blowing up is 1%, the network card failing is 3%, and the disk failing is 1%. And then you can look at all that and then you can sort of calculate the probability of that particular system failing. And then you can look back um, and say, okay, well, which components are, should we focus on? Where should I lower the chance of uh, this system failing? Or you can say, hmm, it's not great that these things are uh, decoupled or that they're coupled and that um, any one of them failing would cause the whole uh, section to fail. So this is uh, a fault analysis tree from um, an airplane. Um, and there's actually software out there where it's just like hundreds of levels of these fault trees. So with a fault tree, what'll happen is, um, say for instance, it says uh, like fire and explosion. Um, if another server or system will break because of a fire explosion, there'll be a whole other tree and that's just one of the branches off of it. Preparedness is, when I was going through the material on preparedness, um, oftentimes it could feel a little dry. You sort of go in and you're like, this is just a bunch of process. I don't, I don't really see how it can help me. And when I was sort of reflecting on when would you really say, okay, I need this, I was thinking about on-call rotations. Imagine when we were first bringing out the idea of on-calls into tech organizations. You would say, all right, I set up the system, it works, it shouldn't break. And then you say, all right, now whose job is it gonna be to fix it when it breaks? It kind of feels weird. It's, it's almost like, well, it's not supposed to break. Why should we put anybody on a rotation to fix it? Um, so preparedness is almost like that, where it's planning for failure. So in 1970, um, there were a series of forest fires in Southern California. Uh, the biggest one being Laguna Fire. Over 13 days, 500,000 acres were burnt, 700 uh, buildings were lost, and 16 people lost their lives. And during this fire, both the Los Angeles County and the Los Angeles uh, City Fire Department were trying to fight the fires. What happened though is instead of um, them effectively fighting it, they ended up um, having miscommunication, people didn't go to fires because they assumed somebody else would go and, and um, uh, deal with it in that location. And afterwards, given the disaster that that whole response was, they put together a commission and they said, okay, what happened? We can't let that happen again. The commission realized that in retrospect, having a single fire department would have been more effective than having the two departments fight it. And they said, okay, how do we avoid making sure this doesn't happen again? And they came up with the incident command system, ICS. So you can think of the incident command system as putting a formal structure on dealing with issues or emergencies. If you think of an orchestra, the conductor is necessary to be there for the whole orchestra to be able to play that beautiful piece of Mozart. Without them, it wouldn't be the same. In an incident, it's the same, it's the same story. You need somebody who's in charge and responsible, who can make executive decisions on what needs to be worked on and what can be ignored at the time. The incident command system is this idea that you have a formal tree structure, um, people constantly report up, and then you can delegate out. It, this system 
had great success, and it moved on and evolved into NIMS, which is the National Incident Management System. Uh, but it still has the same key ideas. If you go out and you do, and you sort of look at the official documents, you'll see these like very large trees with a finance officer, a liaison officer, and the reality is the most important part is having somebody in charge, having that structure. Think back to the last incident or outage you dealt with at work. There was somebody implicitly in charge in that moment. This, the incident command system formalizes that. And what's interesting, or nice about the incident command system is in the tech community, a few companies have begun adopting this. So we've seen Facebook pick this up with their crisis managers. At Shopify, we have IMOX, or incident commanders. And their role will be during an outage, they'll, they're, in addition to their sort of day jobs, they'll be getting paged when there's a big enough incident. And they're not supposed to fix the outage. They're not supposed to actually bring the services back up. Their job is to make sure the right on calls are there, the on calls have their tools that they need, and that customers are getting the information they need, that the stakeholders know what's going on. Response. So we all care about response, and I think we also sometimes tend to uh, overfocus on it, but even with that, there's a lot we can learn from under industries about it. So this is the B B-17. In 1930s, the US Army slash Air Force were running a competition between multiple airline manufacturers to uh, figure out what new bomber they wanted to purchase. And the B-17 was sort of the exciting, shiny new toy. It could fly twice as far, it could carry a lot more weight than any other plane, and it was a lot more resilient to damage. And so they had most of the military officers who were part of the procurement process come out to the airport um, to watch what the B-17 take off and show off its skills. And inside piloting it, piloting it was the head of the test pilots for the Air Force and a very experienced first officer. 17 seconds after liftoff, the airplane crashed. Nobody knew what happened. How could it be that such a good airplane and such experienced pilots had crashed the airplane. The airplane didn't fail mechanically. What had happened is that certain gauges had to be enabled for the airplane to take off. But shortly after takeoff, they had to be uh, disengaged. The thing is, is that both the pilots had forgot to disengage it. So they got a bunch of the test pilots from uh, the Air Force and the Army to go and sort of think, okay, how can we learn to fly this airplane? What do we do? And interestingly, they came back, and they didn't say we need to get better training. Instead, they said we should use a checklist. And so this was the first checklist used in airplanes. It went over some of the most important things to make sure you're doing before takeoff, during takeoff, just after takeoff, before landing, during landing, after landing. And we've seen this evolve over time to sort of take the airline industry by storm. If you think about a profession that uses checklists, the first thing you're gonna think of is you're gonna think pilots. It's so prevalent at this point in airlines that when two airlines merge, the most contentious part is, is often which checklist will be the dominant checklist for that airline. Now imagine the last time you were in an incident, we all have playbooks. Right? We all have, if this service goes down, these are the steps you should do. But how often do we um, fully believe and let the checklist guide us? When I was reading about checklists, I was thinking, okay, I can see the value, but airplanes are very mechanical. They're very, this comes first, then comes a the second thing, then comes a the third thing. And I wasn't excited by the idea of taking all the thinking out of my response to an outage. But interestingly, checklists aren't that. Checklists are a way of automating your thought process during an emergency. You don't put down debug issue on checklist. You put down the obvious. So for instance, if somebody deployed bad code, the first thing you're gonna do is lock deploys. Why should the person who's on call and responding to the issue always have to remember that? We can put that on a sheet of paper. They take out bad deploy checklist, go first thing, lock deploys, done. 
you're freeing up your brain cycles on the more important, the more complex issues that are going on at the time. So this next story is United Airlines Flight 173. United Airlines, the flight was from JFK to Portland with a stopover in Denver. The flight made it to Denver, everything was fine. And then on landing into Portland, as they were lowering the landing gear, they heard a thud. It seemed like the gear was down, but the light wasn't, wasn't showing that the gears were down securely. So the pilots, they had the captain, the first officer, and the flight engineer decided to do a go around and wait in a holding pattern until, um, the gear, until they could figure out and debug what the issue was. So it took them an hour. They were flying around. And then they decided, OK, we should start landing. So they said, we, we won't be able to figure it out. And on their approach to landing, all four engines uh, St uh, stop running. They'd run out of fuel. And the airplane crashed just before the runway. So investigators went and looked at the story and were trying to figure out what had happened. Um, the captain of the flight was one of the most experienced pilots um, at United flying this particular airplane. And when they had first, on their first approach into Portland, they had over an hour of fuel left to debug the issue. They found the flight recorders, and it turns out on the flight recorders, both the first officer and the flight engineer tried to point out that the airplane was running out of fuel. But the captain was so engulfed in trying to figure out what happened to the landing gear that he didn't acknowledge it. The flight engineers, the flight engineer and the first officer didn't know what to do, and so they didn't say anything. In the, seven, in the late 60s and 70s, they went back and they looked at all the recent airline um, accidents. And they saw that in over 70% of the cases, pilots had known what the problem was, but failed to make their other pilots aware of it, or point it out, or force a solution. So what ended up happening was all the airlines knew there was a problem. The NTSB knew there was a problem. And they went to NASA, and NASA and a bunch of uh, psychologists came up with an idea, crew resource management. Crew, crew resource management is, is this formalization of interactions between people operating uh, an aircraft. So it, it seems very obvious when you're going over this. So this is sort of the um, suggested way to talk about issues or problems on an airplane. Of course, you're going to try to get people's attention. Of course, you're going to point out the problem. But this wasn't happening. And what happened is, once this came out, um, the airlines, starting with United and then all other airlines, went, OK, no, we are going to beat this idea into all of our pilots. In training, you always talk about how do you identify an issue? How do you point it out? How do you talk about what the solution is going to be? And they saw that it worked amazingly. Um, this is sort of an example to give you an idea of what this might look like. Um, when you, I was, uh, throughout my research, I was listening um, to pilots tell stories of near misses. And the, in every single one of those stories, they always talked about crew resource management. They always said, uh, the first officer knew to go and work on the issue, and I was flying the plane. Or they said, I asked them to fly the plane, I was working on the issue. We called out what things were going on. And so I, when I think about crew resource management, I think about all the outages that I've experienced at Shopify. I think about the times where something went wrong, an engineer came in and said, hey, this is broken, this is broken, and everybody just ignored them. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't immediately hop on it, because there were six other people saying, oh, this is broken, no, this is broken. And then we go back and we say, oh, look, we have seen this 40 minutes ago. And I'm sure this is the case everywhere. Uh, so imagine if we had started training ourselves to go and use this system, which seems very basic, to respond to um, incidents and outages. Never waste a good crisis. Recovery is arguably one of the most important cycles in an incident. 
after you go and every, every incident has a price to pay. You're either paying for it financially, you're paying for it with time, or worse. So we want to come out of all our crises, disasters, incidents, outages smarter. We want to say, how do we make sure this doesn't happen the next time? How do we say that the next time something breaks, we can fix it faster? We have RCAs. And so RCAs are, quick show of hands, who here has, runs RCAs at work after incidents or outages? Almost the majority of, the, majority of the room. Um, in RCAs, a lot of the time, they almost feel like process. They're, you formally sit down and you go through your five whys. Why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why did this happen? And you try to identify the root cause. But really, it's not what we want from the root cause. The root cause often doesn't give us the exact answer we're looking for. Um, if you think, what's the root cause of people falling? Gravity. Gravity is the root is the root cause of why people fall. But that doesn't give you a lot of information. If a bunch of people are falling outside on the stairs, are you just gonna blame gravity? Are you gonna file an issue? No, you're gonna have to figure out why in that specific area, uh, you, what's the context of people falling in that location? And root causes, uh, sorry, and doing retrospectives or postmortems also, um, they're a way of fighting our own biases. We're all biased people. We all have our own biases that we need to fight. And, um, and having a process and doing it with a team will allow us to sort of point out each other's biases. So one bias is fundamental attribution error. Or as I'm sure we've all written at least once on an RCA doc, human error. If you look back in time, all mistakes look like a choice. The operator chose to fail over the database. The operator chose to ship broken code. But that's not really the case, right? In hindsight, while everything, all the answers look clear, they're not in the moment. And so it's important that when we uh, look at different ways um, other or, uh, organizations are running RCAs, we look at what tools can we take to sort of adopt uh, a system that will allow us to get rid of more of these biases. And NASA has a very interesting one. It's, um, it's called a causal factor tree. And so what they'll do is when there's an issue, they'll map out all the events, all the things that failed, and the conditions at that time. And what's interesting about this is it removes this idea of linearity. You had multiple things going on in parallel. Instead of A leading to B leading to C, any of those events could have happened at different times, and it gives you a clearer picture of what happened in that moment. Here again is uh, another example um, where it's talking about a rocket part failing. And all the other, a lot of the industries out there, so like for instance the aerospace industry, has tooling built for building these sort of trees and models in analyzing um, incidents that happened. So it's not like we'll have to go out and do these things ourselves. People are already doing this. We just go and spend the effort to pick them up and learn and, and see them and, um, and try to implement them. One final very neat um, thing that's out there is the Aviation Safety Reporting System. In 1968, the head of the uh, Aerospace, uh, or sorry, Aeronautics Board in America gave a speech and was talking about how everybody knew uh, and had a lot of internal data on near misses. So if there's not an actual accident, you don't have to technically have to report it. You can just file it away. And every airline had their own stories, their own horror stories. They even knew in some cases of problems with aircraft, but they didn't talk about it. And so he was saying in the speech how this is not okay. And NASA went, wait a second, we're a neutral third party. We don't have any, any uh, leg in this race. So they set up the aviation safety reporting system. Every pilot 
can, if there's a near miss or an accident or a situation that they want to talk about, can anonymously go and report the full story to this uh, service. Then every other pilot can go and read through different reports. The um, ASRS will issue monthly newsletters um, talking about common themes that are going on. In fact, the FAA um, is forbidden from prosecuting any pilots that have, may have done things incorrectly if they submit the report to the ASR ASRS. Imagine if in tech we had a similar system. Who here has deployed bad code into production? Who here has seen a database go out at work? Who here has seen network issues at work? Hmm. Seems like all of us deal with similar problems, maybe different variations, but I'm sure every single one of those incidents could have taught a valuable lesson to another company in this room. The ASRS does that for airlines. Imagine if we started doing that in the tech community. The future is, is coming faster than we think. We're automating away more and more systems. We're modernizing more and more of the technologies we have in our world. Machine learning is making great progress. We're upsetting industries. We don't have the luxury of waiting for something to get our ass in gear and care about this stuff. We have to start caring about it today, and we have to start going and looking at the body of knowledge that's out there that we can use in our own organizations. So I've been talking a lot about being proactive, and I thought it's only fair that I leave you with an example of what proactive companies look like. And interestingly, it's Walmart and Waffle House. Walmart and Waffle House have a lot of locations in the Southeast United States. And as we unfortunately learned this September, that part of the world is very prone to hurricanes. So over time, the management in both these companies realized that they can't just ignore the problem. They have to care about it. With Walmart, before Katrina happened, um, or as Katrina was racing towards the Southeast United States, all the executives gathered in a room and said, all right, we're giving, uh, we understand this is going to be chaos. Um, we're going to give autonomy to the store managers out there. You're going to make decisions that you don't know if you can make those calls. Make them anyway. Do the right thing. So one store manager in uh, Louisiana um, took this to heart. And after Katrina, um, the local responders needed extra supplies. But the store was inaccessible. So what did she do? She took a bulldozer, drove through the wall, took all the supplies, put them out in the parking lot, and gave them away for free. Then she broke into the pharmacy and sent all the medical supplies to a local hospital. In New Orleans, Walmart was actually one of the first companies to bring in supplies because their supply chains were so robust to dealing with natural disasters and crises. Waffle House. <laughs> Let's give it up for Waffle House. Waffle House, similarly, is, tries to be very proactive when it thinks about natural disasters. Waffle House actually runs two sets of menus. It's got its full constant menu, and then it's got a limited scope down menu. The limited scope down menu has less perishables. It doesn't need as much energy or equipment to be functioning to prepare it. So during a disaster, Waffle House will actually scope down the amount of um, uh, items it's serving at its restaurants to deal with the current issue. They also have a, uh, are very, um, organized in making sure what staff can and can't reach the store and can work their shifts. They're so good at this that the director of FEMA um, nicknamed an index about them. <laughs> so there's this thing known as the Waffle House Index. <laughs> I swear all of this is true. It's out there. I was just as surprised as you were. Green Waffle House is serving its full menu. It's not that bad of a storm. Yellow Waffle House 
is serving only their second menu, their partial scope down menu. It's a pretty rough storm. And then red, Waffle House is closed. Shit's real. <laughs> so if I leave you with anything from this talk, try to be so good and so on point about dealing with your incidents with your outages that people think of you and use you as an index for the health of the internet. Try to be the Waffle House of the internet. Thank you. <laughs>